morning and I looked at all the name tags arrayed on the table and there is not one of you that hasn't heard me talk about this stuff at least 20 times. So, uh, you know, forgive me if it seems repetitive, which I guarantee you it will seem repetitive to some degree. Uh, but what I thought I'd do, um, taking off uh, from what uh, Ken said, is to talk a little bit about uh, my perspective on Arizona. Um, and I presume most of you have heard at least once my what's the deal with Arizona talk. Uh, I know Nancy's heard it at least twice. Uh, I know if Judy were here, she's heard it at least three times. Pat, are you up to three? Okay, and it's on the internet. So I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but I am gonna use that as a takeoff point to talk about the public policy implications of my explanation to people from outside of Arizona, what's the deal with Arizona? And, and I know this is relatively easy because I look at all of you, and I know you've heard this before and you've thought about it yourselves, uh, because you are obviously bleeding heart policy wonks. Um, and so therefore a friendly audience for this message. Uh, I, I have had less friendly audiences when I try to explain Arizona to people. And some of the things I explain to them that I think are perceived as problems in Arizona are exactly what they love most about Arizona. Uh, Arizona's kind of in your face uh, 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 politics and perception outside of Arizona. So I started thinking about this for uh, the Morrison Institute State of Our State back in 2011, uh, with the centennial at that point ahead of us. Uh, we are now at a point where the centennial is essentially behind us, and boy, wasn't it really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't even think it's the way I said that that got you to laugh. I think you all honestly feel like, geez, that wasn't much of a celebration, and we didn't feel like we had much to celebrate. Um, but what, what I started reflecting on is why is Arizona, why does Arizona consistently get such negative publicity uh, around the United States and, and what's the deal? And it really, it seemed to me, came down to sort of three issues. Um, one is um, uh, cartoonish politicians. Uh, we're really good at producing cartoonish politicians. Uh, there are several on the ballot in the upcoming election. I hope you can ferret out which ones they are and decide what you think about them. Um, but it, it, we do seem to have politicians who are really good at getting a national profile for various kinds of behavior. Now the truth is that everybody's got cartoonish politicians. But somehow our tradition of cartoonish politicians is so uh, vibrant that it gets revisited periodically. The, the second reason uh, that I think Arizona tends to get a lot of, of visibility nationally uh, is something that we can't do much about, and that is the, the sort of challenges of our geography. Uh, and many of you have heard me talk about this a lot. This isn't the subject of, of today's speech, but there is, I think, a perception, a kind of East Coast Eurocentric perception that, that living in the desert is a colossal demographic mistake and people should never have done it in the first place. And people who live in the sunshine are kind of crazy and weird. And there's been a recent, this really fascinates me, there's been a recent series of articles in the New York Times about the negative perception of air conditioning as a mechanism of altering the physical environment. In contrast to people's perception of heating, air conditioning is generally viewed as profligate, wasteful, energy consumptive, and bad. The truth is, by any objective measure, much of what's done to heat places in the United States is much worse from an energy consumption or carbon footprint consumption. And just think about it for a minute. I mean, you may have a high utility bill, um, but you're not burning diesel oil in your basement. Uh, that is really a bad thing to do. But somehow air conditioning is bad because, because I think the United States has this kind of Eurocentric East Coast perspective. The third reason that, that there's negative views of Arizona is all related to public policy. And it is things like Senate Bill 1070. It is um, uh, the kinds of things that tend to get us high visibility because they are either actually adopted public policy measures or they are at least highly visible public policy proposals in the state legislature. So the, my five factors, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, that, that why Arizona is the way it is. This is the what's the deal with Arizona speech. I want to talk about the public policies for the implications of each of them. So the first one is the geography of insecurity. Now there are two public policy parts to that, or three public policy parts to that, that I think are sort of interesting. The geography of insecurity is about living in the desert, um, and the fact that it's not an easy place 
to build a big city and to have a lot of people. Well, the, pu the public policy success of that, the one great public policy success of Arizona is water management. Uh, you know, that, that is the thing we've been good at. And there are lessons in that. It was a consensus. It was an obvious consensus. You couldn't make this place work unless you moved water to put it here. So we all got along about that for a long time. And they largely still do. Um, that is one of the things that political parties are able to cooperate on because it's so obvious. It's so evident. The two other pieces of public policy that come from the geography and the security thing, one is about the public ownership of land. Okay, so one of the things we have on the ballot coming up is the takeover of all the federal land in the state by the state government. You're going to get to vote on whether or not you think that is a good idea. Now, it doesn't matter one whit what you think, because we can't take the land away from the federal government if we want to. But this will get national publicity as a misguided effort of Arizona public policy, okay? We have a state land department that owns 9 million acres of land. You know how many people they have to actually ride the range and, and police those 9 million acres? Two. <laughs> we, we closed down our state parks two years ago because we didn't have any money to run them. But we should take over the National Forests and the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Okay, this is really smart public policy. But it's part of this kind of in-your-face um, relationship we have with the federal government. We're only here because the federal government made this possible by moving water, by building highways, by funding airports. And yet, we distrust and dislike the federal government as a matter of sort of stated public policy in Arizona. The third piece of this, the, in, uh, geography and security, is our relationship with the border. And this has been the premier um, visible public policy of Arizona over the last couple of years because of Senate Bill 1070 and the, and the impact that has on us. And our frustration is, that um, we don't really have, and we really can't have, particularly meaningful public policy to deal with our geographic position next to the border. But in that frustration, we lash out and adopt ill-considered and, and um, a meaningless public policy to make a statement, again, about our relationship with the federal government and so on. Now, my sense is that, that um, the policy expressed by Senate Bill 1070 is beginning to turn that people are beginning to feel differently about that, and that we are perhaps getting back to a realization that this is a larger problem than just lashing out in some kind of xenophobic spasm, um, and, and that we need some more comprehensive solution, and that needing people to actually work and build stuff um, should result in some kind of guest worker sort of program. But that's a long, slow boat to change. It, it, it hurts us in a public policy perception because we were at the front of that. And we're often at the front of public policy changes. That's one of the themes I want to come back to in a minute. The second of my factors of, of sort of why Arizona is the way it is, is the institutional immaturity factor. Um, we just don't have the long-term consistent institutions that other states have. And you all are an example of that. The philanthropic community here does not have the long, deep roots it has in Indianapolis. You know, a much smaller city, um, in virtually any city in the United States, because of our institutional immaturity, because we were the last big city to boom and grow in the United States, because Arizona was the baby state, that sort of insulting moniker that we had until we dreamed up the Grand Canyon State as a <laughs> macho kind of image. Um, we don't have the, 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 the philanthropic and the private community to create institutions that moderate and advance public policy. And it isn't just philanthropy, it's equally true of, of corporate and business uh, communities. You know, We became a center of business just as a lot of commerce became global, just as banks became national, just as manufacturing went offshore. And we've been kind of the last stop before things go offshore because it was cheap to live here. That's our public policy. Let's make it cheap to live and we will boom. There it is. That is the statement of Arizona's public policy worldview. Make it cheap to live here and we will boom. Um, so uh, the, 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 the globalization also results in, in institutions. So Judy, you can just sit out there if you want because you've heard this like three or four times. I'm trying to mix it up a little bit and change it slightly. Um, so, I, you know, I think that um, the, the thinness of the institutions is part of what leads to 
the overriding theme I want you to get at the end of this, which is the hallmark of public policy in Arizona, this is one of the words I used, is inconsistency. We're not consistent about our public policy, and that's the worst thing you can do. It's worse to be inconsistent than it is to just not have a policy. Because just as you do something and you start everybody headed in one direction, if you change your mind, you disrupt everything and you set things back. So I want to come back to inconsistency because I think all these things can be. The third one of my factors is the unstable population factor. The people come and go. You know, it used to be for every five who move here, three leave. Now it's been for every five who move here, six leave. We're back to like four. You know, I don't know where it will rebalance itself. But because we boom so late, because we churn population so fast, we have a lot of people here who don't know anything about Arizona. And a lot of them are in the legislature. <laughs> I mean, this is true. People move here because they figure this is the Wild West, and I can get easily elected to office two or three years after I come. Now, that's not, not necessarily a bad thing. The absence of, of a sort of old boy network can be, can be energizing, can be revitalizing. For a community, but if you have a bunch of people making decisions about how to run the state who don't know anything about the state, it's not a good thing. You need some kind of perspective and some kind of sense of that. Um, because we're this kind of desert encampment of people coming and moving, and on top of that, we don't have any sort of dominant cultural roots. You know, I think about two of our neighboring states in this regard: New Mexico. New Mexico is a state that the state of deep and meaningful Hispanic heritage, and they celebrate it, and they care about it, and it is a backdrop to everything they do and think about. That creates an expectation about what matters, about how you should behave, about how you should celebrate who you are. Utah is a state of deep and meaningful Mormon roots, and it creates a backdrop and an expectation, even though it's not a majority of the population by any means, more Catholics in Utah than there are Mormons. But it's the origin of that state. And it, and it creates a kind of cultural expectation and, and a fair amount of public policy expectation. Um, the, the Utah is much more, as a state, at the state level, much more interested in the general welfare of its citizenry than Arizona is, frankly. And much of that comes out of that tradition, not what happens here. You know, our tradition is a state that was founded by a bunch of land swindlers, you know, Daryl Duplo, Jack Swell, and those kind of guys and a place that boomed because we transplanted a lot of people from the Midwest. So, you know, I, I, I said to somebody last week, you go to a barbecue uh, in a backyard in Arizona, and pretty soon you'll be talking to somebody about how great Iowa is. <laughs> because they came from there, and they left because they didn't find a job, because they didn't want to be a farmer, because they didn't like snow. <laughs> but they're not talking about how great Arizona is. They're talking about how great Iowa is. It's happening last night that somebody was telling me about um, the fourth factor is uh, conservative populism. And this is a really, this is the part of this talk where I get in trouble with some people uh, about politics. Um, but it is an underlying force in Arizona public policy that's kind of a problem. Now, Arizona was a populist state from the start. It was a liberal populist state. The, the international workers of the world, the labor unions, and the mines, and all that stuff. But post-World War II, that liberal populism transformed into a conservative populism. And a lot of it is Barry Goldberg, um, who, who sort of realized that there was a, a, an energy to tap. Um, but a lot of it, I think, also was the in-migration of people moving here in the expectation that they could be left alone. That this was a place where you didn't really need government. You didn't really need society. You could just be a cowboy. And they wanted to leave wherever it was they were leaving so they could come here and be left alone to live their lives with a gun, a dog, and a chain of fence. Um, and of course, it's a mythology. Um, it isn't the way we live here. And we couldn't live here unless we had government that created for us these big plumbing systems that moved water. And if we didn't have the federal government that made this place possible in the first place, but people move here and don't realize that, and don't uh, appreciate it, and don't expect it. Give you some public policy manifestations of conservative populism that hurt Arizona. This is not a pro-business state. Okay, now we're ranked at the moment, I think the last ranking I saw, we were number 10 in good places to do business, but it's not because we have pro-business policies. It's because we just don't have policies. 
We don't have anti-business <laughs> policy, but we don't have pro-business policies. And, and I think the best example of a public policy manifestation of this kind of conservative populism is our distrust of any kind of economic development, incentives, encouragement, and again, our inconsistency in that regard. We're the only state without tax increment financing. The only state without tax increment. A mechanism designed to encourage development of a kind where you want it and what you want. But it would create, we say, an unlevel playing field. And we think that the, the right answer is just to have low taxes across the board and a level playing field. Well, we don't have low taxes across the board and a level playing field. Our, our um, commercial property taxes are sixth highest in the nation. Our residential property taxes are the 37th in the nation. The message that sends to the marketplace is, we want retired millionaires to move here. We are not interested in business. And that's been successful. That is the public policy we articulate. It is the public policy we implement. It's what we get as a result of that. And yet, we don't wind up making meaningful changes to that. We wind up perpetuating that, because we've got to fund the state somehow, and it's easy to beat up on businesses and corporations. I, I do a lot of work about um, sort of business incentives. And it is fascinating to me the problems I have in Phoenix and the problems I have in Tucson. Because they wind up in the same place from exactly different perspectives. In Phoenix, my problem with business incentives when I'm advocating them is the Goldwater Institute. A, a consistent public policy advocate that says business incentives are bad because we should just have lower no taxes across the board. We don't want to pick winners and losers. In Tucson, my problem when I go down there and talk about business incentives is the more liberal perspective that business is bad, corporations are evil, we shouldn't give them any incentives at all. Winds up in the same place. There is a good way to formulate public policy, take one extreme and the other, mix them together and wind up in the same non-action uh, uh, non kind of uh, uh, place. Um, and another example of this is I did a talk a while back for the American Public Private Association. Now these are people who advocate public-private partnerships to build like roads, you know, schools, those kinds of things. They came to Scottsdale. These are East Coast guys, by the way, because they figured Arizona would be nirvana for public-private partnerships. Because their perception of the problem of public-private partnerships is the strength of the public employee unions in the East. They don't want anything privatized, so they can't get any deals done. They can't get public-private partnerships. So they came out here to learn how to do it. And I had to say to them, wait, time out, guys. You got to understand, in a public-private partnership, you have to have a robust public sector. That wouldn't be popular in Arizona. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, we don't do public-private partnerships because we believe the public will be fleeced by the private sector, so it should be just left to the private sector. Don't, don't try to, 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 to work out any kind of, and they were shocked by this. They had no idea that there would be a conservative viewpoint that public-private partnerships were negative. The last fact I want to talk about, it and, and then um, try to reach some conclusion here about what's new about public policy issues in Arizona, is the boom and bust nature of our economy. Um, that is who we are. That's what we've done. We built a machine called Arizona that is built on the concept of boom and bust. That's what our tax policy is about. That's what our land use policy is about. That's what our economic development policy is about. The notion of Arizona is that cheap land and sunshine will result in people moving here. End of public policy. That's our public policy perspective. Cheap land and sunshine move here. Well, it works. It's worked really well. It's worked unbelievably well. But it means that our economy goes like this. Because when you bet on migration and real estate, you bet on a boom and bust cycle. Well, the dilemma of that is it drives inconsistent public policy decisions. So in the times of boom, we have some extra money. And maybe we spend that extra money implementing some kind of public policy, and then we bust, and we cut back on that public policy. And of course, also in times of boom, because we have extra money, we have to cut taxes. So then in times of bust, we don't have any tax revenues left, so we can't implement any of the public policy. And think about the examples of this. I mean, all day kindergarten, yeah. right? We concluded that was an enormously important thing to make Arizona a better place. And we should fund it, and how long did it last? Three years, four years? You know, because suddenly we busted and we couldn't afford it anymore. And you know, it was a frill, we didn't have it for a long time, so let's get rid of it. Science Foundation Arizona. Okay? We're gonna put a lot of public money in the Science Foundation Arizona. It's gonna be a public partnership managed by private money. We fund it for a couple of years, then we start eroding that. 
So the, so the message that's sent is, well, that wasn't such an important public policy after all. Um, solar energy tax credits, health care. I mean, one, there's one example after another here of, of where we, we try to implement a public policy, but after three or four years, it gets kind of hard, you know? And so well, maybe we shouldn't do this after all, and so we start cutting back. The worst thing you can do is inconsistent behavior with regard to public policy. And we've never in Arizona been able to really fixate for the long term on what we want to do with public policy. Do we want to make higher education as affordable as possible for everyone in the state? That's in the Constitution, for heaven's sake, tuition as well as possible. We're doing everything we can to interpret that to not mean what it says. Now, that may not be wrong. It may be that, that Michael Crow's model is right, raise tuition a lot, but create a lot of robust scholarships so it does make it affordable for the people who need it. I, I'm not at all sure that's the wrong policy, though I had to pay for three children. <laughs> um, but we don't tend to move over the long term in consistent ways, which is why public policy work and public policy funding by other than government is critical. Government in Arizona is a troubling proposition. We're not sure we believe in government. Mm -hmm. And we're not sure how we should act. The, the, the overwhelming message that I try to get across to people about Arizona is that Arizona is an immature place where the social compact is still being negotiated. We don't really know what is included in the social compact. You know, the social compact is that notion that in order to run an orderly society, each of us has to surrender some measure of our personal rights. We're burdened by that, but we're benefited by everyone else surrendering some measure of their rights. And so, you know, there are some fairly simple components of the social compact. Crime should be bad. We should try to stop crime. Um, we should have traffic laws so people don't run into each other. In Vietnam this summer, and in traffic circles in Vietnam, you go both ways. <laughs> this is a failure of the social compact. <laughs> it's counterclockwise or clockwise. Pick one. <laughs> so there's some obvious elements of the social compact, but there are a lot of less obvious elements. Uh, I used to think that free, robust, high quality, Kindergarten through 12th grade education was an obvious element of the social compact, funded by the public. <coughs> Not so sure anymore, but we think that. Uh, I think most people would say yes, but they're not quite as enthused as they maybe used to be. Higher education, the Morrill Act told us that higher education, funded by the states, was a component of the social compact. That's clearly changing. State parks to be, you know, parks and quality of life things? Is that part of the social compact? No, I don't know. You know. Public funding for the arts, apparently not very much part of the social compact anymore. Used to be once in a, you know, past Nirvana-like time that is long gone. But, um, I mean, there, there are all these elements that are sort of on the table in there. Now, what's different about Arizona is we never had entirely figured this out. There are other states that thought they had, places like Wisconsin, you know, that are now renegotiating with their votes in the social compact. We didn't quite get it, get it inked. So I, I think the important thing out of all that is to think about that kind of a big picture of what public policy is about. What can you do to affect it and make it better? I promised Sue Clark Johnson that at this point I would advocate give money to the Morrison Institute for <laughs> Policy at where I work part time and Nancy used to work because we will write you reports that will tell you what's wrong and how to figure it out. Uh, that was my commercial blip that I promised to Sue. But, but, but the larger message here is pick stuff that really matters and stick to it. Be consistent about it. Be consistent about the message. Be consistent about why it matters. Be consistent about how it can improve things. Be consistent about how it will fix Arizona's image. Be consistent about how it will make life better here for people. It has to be about more than cheap houses and such. That's been a formula that worked, but Arizona 
as a notion, has to stand for something more than that. And we have to figure out what it is, and we have to communicate it, and we have to stick 